Oh, thanks very much for that great introduction. If you're wondering what this weird thing on my arm is, it's gathering sand, sound for Sam down the back who's filming this. And he told me I had to do this when I started the talk. Okay, I don't know why, but he thought it was important. Okay, um, I'm going to use, I'll just kind of stand over this way to get out of your way, and hopefully this mouse will change the slides. So I'm going to be going through a list of questions here. I'm going to ask, is New Zealand clean, green and 100% pure? Is central government protecting biodiversity and the environment in New Zealand? Are we 100% pure in comparison with the rest of the world? I wanted to, um, John Key seems to think we are, and he seems to disagree with me on this. Um, said that my opinion is just, well, I'm just a scientist, you just go and get another opinion. They're like lawyers, you know, you can just get any old opinion you want. The big, the big issue really is, is dairy farming sustainable in New Zealand? It's, it's you know, so much a part of having driven down to the Dunedin yesterday and back again today, and, and being a South Islander who hasn't been back for years, I can't believe the change that's happened down there. And um, I want to really question and have everybody go away thinking about whether, whether dairy is good for New Zealand or not. And, and behind all this is, does the Resource Management Act protect the environment? So um, that's, that's kind of what I'll go through. <clears throat> so to start off with this 100% pure, this is the, the, the advertising poster. Um, they've, they've kind of backed down a little bit now. They've changed it to 100% pure. Uh, no, 100% New Zealand or 100% U or some stupid thing like that. But 100% the, the pure New Zealand, we have the highest, we have the world record. We don't just have the Rugby World Cup we have the highest proportion of threatened species of any country in the world. So there's a, there's a good record. 2,788 threatened species out of around 10,000 species altogether. So, you know, that's, that's one. And if you break up, just looking at those species, obviously we didn't have many, for instance, of frogs and terrestrial mammals to start off with. But it, the lines there are just the proportion of species that are listed as threatened. And, and if you look at breaking it up into those groups. All of those groups there, more than 50% of the species in this country are threatened. And the other thing to keep in mind here is of the 10,000 species, 4,000 odd were listed as data deficient. The chances are that they're data deficient because we can't find them because they're not there anymore. And one way to solve a biodiversity crisis from the government's point of view is to put less money into the Department of Conservation and into science. If you, if you don't have scientists naming species or looking for species, then the problem goes away. And, and just in case, just to um, keep, you, keep in mind that it's not, that it is a recent thing, you know, it's not something that's been, um, you know, obviously there is impacts that have happened um, a few hundred years ago, but really the last 20 years, is, you can see that increase in the number of threatened and at-risk taxa there in the last 20 years, really starting to drive up. The same story for freshwater fish as well. <clears throat> if you look at that, an, another level up, look at ecosystems, there's some work that Landcare has done, um, pretty much breaking the country up into, into ecosystems. 68% of them are listed as threatened now. And what it's all about is that a third of the country is, in, is protected, and we hear this coming up all the time, we should be really proud that a third of the country is in conservation estate, but really it was just the third that nobody else wanted. It's the alpine areas, it's the bits that are too steep or unfarmable or unlivable. So we really um, have great representation of alpine areas in our conservation areas and really, really poorly uh, present, uh, protect the lowland areas. A study of 300 sites from regional councils that have just been collected, the data's been collected from all around the country, found that 96% of pasture sites failed bathing standards, and mostly it was around pathogens. And so 88% failed phosphorus, that's DRP, and 80% uh, failed nitrogen. Look at urban streams, 100% of the urban streams failed those um, standards. 92% phosphorus, 85% of nitrogen. So th this is all of our lowland streams. Does this sound like a 100% pure, clean, green country where 90%, 96% of the streams you wouldn't be safe to, to swim in. Um, and by the way, I've, I tried to get hold of that data. That was 2004, that data from the 300 sites around New Zealand. The councils won't let me get hold of it to see what's been happening in the meantime, so they're keeping it to themselves. 
Lakes, of course, the same thing's happening there. 43% of our lakes are officially listed as polluted now, this report, um, a report that came out last year. Uh, excess nutrients, and most of those lakes also have issues with exotic fish now. So it's 43% of all of the lakes, of 43% of the 112 that are monitored. Modelling shows that about 43% of all of them will be in that same state. And that's nearly, it's more than 90% of the lowland lakes. So when you think about, oh, it's only 43% of our lakes, it's actually all, nearly all of the lowland lakes. Anything that's got farming in the catchment, it's in trouble or it's got to this point. It doesn't end on the land. That's the, another thing to think about. It doesn't just end w at the end of those rivers. All of those impacts, sediment and nutrients, then have ongoing effects in the harbours and estuaries. And so we have, the, the, as an example, Snapper only breed now in one harbour, in the Kaipara Harbour, because of sediment build-up, which is choking the eelgrass, which was the spawning areas for them. So it, it keeps on going, and you can imagine the economic impact on our ocean fisheries as well. We did this experiment where we put pit tags, radio tags, on a bunch of native fish, 136 of them in 100 metres of, of this little stream, let them go again, Kawaro, uh, short jawed kokapu, redfin bullies, five species, let them go again, and then went back with a reader, with a pit tag reader, to see where they'd gone. Um, had a student that did that over a year. Camped by the river, lived in a caravan, went out every couple of days and waved the wand. Took a couple of hours to go over the river. Took us hours to set this, I mean months and months to set this up because we had to map the whole river. And the idea is you go along, you ping the individual fish, its ID number comes up and you locate it on a map exactly where it is to figure out where they were. Months and months and months of work went into all this. Let the fish go. First day out, waved the wand over them. Did the whole thing, took two hours, found 11 fish. The student was distraught. You know, we thought the whole project was a total waste of time. But she kept at it and the next day she went out and she caught 13. And, but none of that 13 were the original 11. And then day after day, by the time we got to the fourth or fifth day, you're starting to pick up some of those originals. But the message here is that 90% of the time, the fish were down in the substrate, in those spaces that you can see in that upper half. There's a labyrinth of spaces and channels, and that's where the fish were hanging out. The reader could only read 30 centimetres, maybe less through rock. So we're only picking up the ones as they were coming up to the surface. And so what, it, what, it, what the effect of this is, is it's like an apartment building. And so you've got everybody living in the apartment building, and so in this 100 metres of stream, because we were counting the ones that weren't tagged as well, were how many fish were living in 100 metres of this stream. It's a really unusual stream. But that is how much that stream could carry. What you normally see, and what you see at all the rivers next door, is a bit like the bottom half of that slide, where the sediment is built up over time, and all you've got is this few rocks on the surface, so that will only cover for them is, so you've gone from an apartment building to living on the roof, basically. So then you go from 433 fish to four or five fish over that length of river. So that's such a crucial part of the habitat for native fish in New Zealand. We don't measure it. And it's a, you know, I mean, that's as big an issue as any of these things, with sediment, because of land use change. So that's what's coming down. We don't measure it. The other thing we don't measure is river engineering, the stop banking and bulldozing that goes on. When I don't know how much of it I haven't had much time in the South Island, but it's a huge issue in the North Island. I mean, stop banking. The Manawatu River is a great example. We're from the gorge to the sea, 60 or 70 kilometres of stop bank. The, the river is not able to move anymore. It's stuck between this channel. It has to run down there. The sediment's building up after the 2004 flood, which is a one in a hundred year flood. When it, it almost went over and took out Palmerston. It was, was millimetres away from uh, topping the stop bank. So it was good engineering work. Uh, 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 when it's gone, the river would only contain a 1 in 50 year flood. So what do we have to do? We have to build the stop bank up, 60 or 70 kilometres of stop bank. In Palmerston North City, there's not enough space now between the river and the town. To, you've got to go wider to go higher with your stop bank. So now they have to put wooden sides on it to get that extra half metre. How long can we keep doing that for? I mean, in the States, in the Mississippi, you just, you just give up one day and you go, well, that, we're just going to have to flood because we can't contain this thing anymore. The, the sensible thing to do would be to go up into the headwaters and, and where all this steep country is being farmed for sheep, um, you know, 
hanging onto the side of these cliffs and things, and, that, and the farmers are still up there poisoning manuka out of the gullies. That's where you go to fix the problem. Instead of spending millions on the bottom end of it, on this, on this you know, impossible situation where you just can't keep out of it. But again, we don't measure that. We have no measure of what's being done. It's a huge issue all over New Zealand. I went along to one of these meetings recently and I'm trying to explain to these guys that the LE effect, it's a, an ecological idea that there's a minimum number required to successfully have a spawning event. So what, I'm, what I use as the example is the, the passenger pigeon or carrier pigeon in the state. So early 1900s, or right up until the early 1900s, back into history, the sky used to darken. There was that many pigeons flying through the sky to this one place where they all used to get together and have a breeding event. Went on forever. People just thought they were like rubbish. They were shooting them to put on the garden for fertiliser and, you know, they were just so thick, like we used to do with white bait. <clears throat> and then one year, they disappeared. They got down to what was estimated to be six million and that wasn't enough for them to have a set. You know, whether it's they couldn't find each other, whether they couldn't fight off predators, whatever, there's a minimum number. The trouble with it is, I mean it's great, but you don't know what that number is until it's too late. It's only looking back you can say what that number was. So we may be at the point of losing the long fin eel. And it won't be like the black robin or the kakapo when we get down to the last 50 or the last two. The last, you know, last 50 kakapo might be 6 million eels. You know, we, we don't know. If it's 6 million, they that could be it, and we won't know until it's too late. That's what I'm talking about, playing with fire. If you're going to have, and section 10 of their act says that they can't use a lack of science as an excuse to carry on fishing. And they, and, and they are carrying on fishing. And there's just this inertia there, and there's this thing that I've, I've, I'm talking about scientists involved in this on all sides, whether they're with industry or with the ministry, embedded scientists. You know this idea that you have embedded journalists that go over to war? Well, it's the same thing. These guys work for the organisations that rely on these for the funding. They rely on Ministry of Primary Industries for funding. They rely on the fishermen for funding. They rely on that to pay the mortgage and feed the kids and everything. You can't have independence, you know. These guys are part of the business. And, and so they'll keep on fiddling un, until it's gone. I can see that because I just can't shape them, you know. They can, oh, but we, we'll just have another look at this and we'll play around with this and... Oh, it looks all right. They're basing it mainly on catch per unit effort as, as their excuse. They say that, that this is... Um, I think I've got it on this. Oh, I mean, and this is, this is the kind of science that comes from... This is the words that come from them. This is from their own report. They acknowledge that the current levels of exploitation are not sustainable. So what they're talking about is catch per unit effort is not changing. So the idea is that if you're you know, taking, I don't know, bugs from a bucket, they're breeding in a bucket of water, and you keep taking out 20 every day, and there's always you know, enough to keep on taking 20, well, it's sustainable. The idea is they put out a set of traps, and they catch the same number of fish, so therefore it's not going down. The trouble is that they keep moving. And so you're going to keep catching lots of fish until there are no fish, because you keep moving, and you keep going to a new place where you haven't been before. That's why they want to go into the dock estate, because every site they go to, they've never been before. So of course the catch per unit effort will always be high. You can't not be, but that's their excuse for carrying on. All of the other figures show the opposite. Um, okay, so now to John Key and, and his 100% pure. How do we compare with the rest of the world? Well, obviously it's really hard to compare countries in this kind of thing, but um, so one of, the, one of the things that we can look at is that pretty much we, all the countries use the same rules around what makes a threatened species a threatened species. So if we look at, at freshwater with our fish, 63% of them are threatened. The global average is 37%, so we're not looking so good there. Um, South Africa was the only one I could find that was at that level. Um, definitely we're worse than Europe, 42%, and USA, 37 So, you know, we're not looking too good when it comes to freshwaters. That graph that I showed you of the up and down, up and down oxygen in the Manawatu River is what you can do with that data and what is done around the world is you can do this thing called uh, and, and it's simply the difference between the minimum and the maximum is gross primary productivity it's a measure of the health of the river so um, 0 to 3 is a healthy river 3 to 7 is satisfactory greater than 7 is impacted 
that's on the GPP, which is the difference between the min and the max. The Manawatu River at two sites, not just at Hopelands, but also at Opiki, which is down below Palmerston North, scored 107. So it's not even, you know, it's right off the page. Nowhere in the world, so there's 570 sites that Cawthron's gathered data for from around the world and New Zealand, no other uh, site has ever been that high. The highest that we could find, I think, was 67 on a river in Belgium below a wastewater treatment plant. So we're not, you know, I mean, it shocked me. I knew we were bad, but that is, is, is you know, worse than anywhere in the world. Oh, this, this is lakes. So all, all I've got here is just comparison between USA, Europe, Canada, and New Zealand when it comes to chlorophyll A is just a measure of how it's the algae levels in the in the lakes, and it's a measure of how much nutrients going in there. Um, and so lower down the graph is better. So Canada obviously beats us all. But look, we're just about legal, level pegging. That's our 112 lakes and compared with Europe. We're about equal with Europe when it comes. So I don't know when people think about who's clean and green, but do we think Europe's clean or not? But we're about evil, even with them and we're definitely better than the States. But <laughs> this is a study that came out a couple of years ago from um, one of the big universities in Australia. They did a comparison of 179, which is pretty much all of the countries in the world. They ranked them for... Things like um, natural forest loss, fertiliser use, threatened species, habitat conversion, water pollution, carbon dioxide emissions, and I think it was marine captures. Ranked all the countries in the world. We're, we're 18th. Not 18th from the top, 18th from the bottom of this worldwide comparison. 161 countries scored higher than us on environmental um, performance. And and, you know, okay, so it's a per capita thing. So we're only a small country, so if you took, you know, if you looked at overall impact, then surely we'll be okay. No, 47th, we're still 47th worst, 47 from the bottom on overall impact. I think Brazil was the top, and then, or China, Brazil, USA, we're right up there on the, on the highest impact. We're way, uh, you know, we're, we're uh, sorry, on the worst, you know, so we're right down there with those guys, down, down at, the, at the worst end of it. Now, I wanted to get on to this um, dairy farming because this is a really big part of the problem, is that intensification that's happened in the last few years. I want you to think about what's sustainable about dairy farming in New Zealand. For a start, to carry the number of cows that we do at the moment, we've had to be, we've had, we've had to bring in, um, Superphosphate, phosphorus for a long time, phosphate for a long time now. So it came from Nauru, we destroyed a whole bunch of Pacific Islands, scraping it off and bringing it over here starting in the 1940s. It now comes from Morocco, and it's, you know, like we, the human issues around destroying Pacific Islands are bad enough, but Morocco, we buy it off the royal, royal family in Morocco that are apparently stealing it from the West Saharans. So there's whole you know, sort of human rights issues around that that we won't even get into. I said before, the 800% increase in nitrogen fertiliser use. Most of this nitrogen, or all of it, is coming from our gas fields. It's being converted, so it's fossil fuels turned into nitrogen, put on the land to grow this stuff, and most of it's ending up in our rivers and lakes. But how sustainable is it to take fossil fuels to grow food? The... Greenhouse gas, em gas emissions um, have increased by 40% since, since 1990 and nearly all of that increase has come from dairy farming. Of the stuff that's coming from agriculture, nearly all of it has come from dairy farming. Got nitrous oxide as well. Think about the energy side of it with palm kernel. So the other way we feed all these cows in this country is to bring palm kernel. There's a whole lot of em environmental issues around palm, palm oil, but we won't even get into that. Just think about the food miles of bringing palm oil from Indonesia and all over the place into this country to feed our cows. So what happened is that we, we bring this phosphate that's coming from Morocco now, but it came from, from Nauru. The thing that comes with it is cadmium. It was, the phosphate is just bird shit that's built up over, over millennia on those islands. So... The birds concentrated marine cadmium from what, from what they were eating into their ship. It got piled up onto the land. We scraped it off, put it on the land here. So as we've been putting phosphate on the land, we've been adding cadmium to the land. The cadmium levels are increasing and increasing. Cadmium is a known carcinogen. Um, it, it has all kinds of health effects that you can you know, look up if you want to, but it's, it's a very dangerous heavy metal. 
It's been building up and building up in this soil. So the graph there is just showing that in 1940 when we started aerial top dressing or we started putting phosphate onto the land here, about the time we started ripping into Nauru, cadmium has been increasing in our soils to the extent that the one regional council in New Zealand that's being honest about this, Environment Waikato, or as it was then, of course you're not allowed to call it Environment now, it's Waikato Regional Council, 160,000 hectares in 2005 when this report was done exceed this one milligram per kilogram. That's the one part per million limit. And at that point, the land is a contaminated site. Under the biosecurity, the biosolids uh, regulations in this country, one milligram per kilogram cadmium is a contaminated site. But, but don't worry, because earlier on this year, under the National Environment Standards, all agricultural land was exempted from that classification. So it's not contaminated anymore. I'm not allowed to say that. It's not contaminated, because we stopped agricultural land from being called contaminated. At, at point eight, so look at the graph there. So 160,000 hectares has exceeded the one milligram per kilogram. At point eight milligrams per kilogram, then you're not allowed to, to, to subdivide into a lifestyle block. If this soil cadmium is above 0.8 milligrams per kilogram, the, the, the theory being, so that the issue is if you grow food on that land, it takes up the cadmium, you eat the food, you ingest the cadmium to danger levels. So that's at one milligram. It's, the theory is that if you're on a lifestyle block, you could get or you might get all of your food from your own land. So therefore 0.8, so it's a, a more strict level because you're going to grow it there. Urban, like around here, it's allowed to go up to 3 milligrams per kilogram because they figure that you'll only get 20% of your food out of the garden. It's a tough shit if you get all of your food out of the garden at that level, but this is just kind of trying to average things. So um, that, that's the contaminated site level. It, it doesn't get past to milk. Otherwise, it wouldn't have happened. We wouldn't be doing it. We wouldn't be putting phosphate on if it went to milk because we would have been kicked out of all of our markets by now. It builds up in the livers and kidneys of the stock. It's illegal to sell for human consumption, the livers and kidneys of any stock in this country over 18 months old. And there has been for at least 10 years. So they, they, you know, the, the officials know about this problem, but they're not telling anyone about it. So, I don't know which bit to go through first, but, okay, so where, where does it go to? They're supposed to go to secure landfill, it doesn't. It, it's been going, we suggested a few years ago that it was going to pet food. Either pet food or blood and bone is the two possibilities I was given. If it goes to blood and bone fertiliser, it doesn't go onto dairy land because of the risk of CJD, so it goes onto your garden. So potentially we're concentrating cadmium through these organs into blood and bone onto the land. Our guess turned out to be right with the pet food. One of the, one of the researching vets at Massey contacted me the other day because I'd given this presentation a year ago at Massey, and he got hold of, he won't tell me, and I, well, he did tell me, but I can't tell you, but one of the major pet food companies in New Zealand, he tested the pet food, and it was very high in cadmium. He got hold of them. They were very worried about it. They've reduced it fivefold. That's what he would tell me, but I don't know after a fivefold reduction what the level is, but he managed to get a major change in the amount of cadmium in there by cutting out livers and kidneys. But um, they don't want to advertise it. They don't want to tell anyone. It's a great win, but you're not going to get anywhere selling something, telling people that it doesn't have something that you didn't know it had in the first place. So. They're not going to tell anyone about it, you know, so that hasn't changed. <clears throat> um, uh, what have I forgotten? Okay, so one of the issues is that it goes to food, right? So whatever you grow on here, it started to turn up on our potatoes already. The really frightening thing is there's two standards out there in the world. There's the European standard for how much that, that, you know, you're allowed to eat. The European standard. If we apply to the European standard, the Ministry for Health does a total weekly intake study of, of diets of New Zealanders. The latest one, 2009, showed that all of our children, I mean, they break them up into toddlers and blah, 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 they've got about three classes, but up to 15 years old, they all exceed the, the European standard for cadmium intake in this country. So it's already showing up in our, in our kids' diets. Of course, we don't use the European standard. We use the World Health Organization one that just happens to be two and a half times more lax than that. So... We, we aren't exceeding the standard that we use, but if you were in Europe, you'd be exceeding the standard by that much. And you know, we, ex we export lots of our food to Europe, so it's potentially a big issue in the future, not just for exports. But the thing that gets me is that well, where, it, where it hits home to me is that most of the people that I know, you know, 
and I and I probably you know my friends are weirdos, but most people think that this this whole lot's going to come crashing down one of these days. This economy, but but here in New Zealand we'll be okay because we you know we've got lovely clean green New Zealand. We can grow our own food, right? But not if we've contaminated it with cadmium feeding you know milk to the rest of the world, milk powder. So you know this is a really huge issue. I challenge you to go home and the two big fertiliser suppliers in New Zealand, Ravensdown and uh, Balance. Go to their web page, type in cadmium in the search engine. I have, and it comes up with nothing. Zero. Well, on Ravensdown, I think it comes up with a company that will test for it. That's the only thing you'll get. Fertiliser New Zealand is their cover group. Type it into their web page, search. The other day, so I wrote this, I've been trying to get this story out forever. Wrote this article, rewrote it 20 times for the Dominion, they still wouldn't publish it in the end after mucking me around for months. So I put it on Bernie Hickett, Bernard Hickey's web, um, interest.co.nz webpage. Got a whole lot of hits there, a whole lot of information, a whole lot of stuff happened. A week later, um, straight, straight Furrow, the farming paper, ran the story with the headline, Cadmium Issue Refuted. It had a whole lot of pieces from my article about the things that I've just been telling you. And then it had this quote from Dr. Reese from Ministry for Primary Industry saying, Obviously, Dr. Joy doesn't know about our cadmium working group, and we've got a plan. Well, if he'd read the article properly, I said, yes, there's a cadmium working group. There's one MPI person, and the rest are industry on the cadmium working group. And my question, and luckily they, they published my, I wrote a letter back the next week, and they published it, I was quite surprised. I said, oh, thanks, Dr. Reese, I did realise that. And my question to you is, has this working group has the work of this working group and the, and the plan they've come up with resulted in any less cadmium going onto the land in New Zealand? And I answered it for him. I'll answer it. No, it hasn't. We now put 30 to 40 tonnes of cadmium on the land a year. So we have a cadmium working group, but it doesn't mean any less cadmium's going. What they've done is this classic situation where they're trying to source superphosphate with less cadmium, but because we're expanding so much in our dairy then overall we're putting more cadmium on than we were before. It's that old crusty issue. You fix, you become more efficient, but you do more of it, so the net effect is worse. So this is, this is a massive cover-up, and if you want to think about why there's a cover-up, it's because of land values. If you remember when council started you know, putting out in limb reports where subdivisions were on you know, um, you know, sheep dips and all that kind of thing, then all sorts of hell was to pay, because you don't want to tell me that my land's contaminated. Well, all those dairy farms. Well, I've got. I was leaked a letter from um, Fonterra to Waikato Regional Council in 2005 when this report was was made ready, threatening them. The most aggressive email I've read in a long time, saying to Environment Waikato, if you dare release this, have you thought about what it would do to the economy of the Waikato? And, it, and they managed to block it for two years. So you can look at that report online. If you go to um, Waikato Regional Council, just type in cadmium, you'll get the report. It's a 187-page technical report. Good luck. That, 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 I mean, all the information's there, but you'll have to read through it to, to pull it all out, and there's some great stuff in there. But that, that took two years they managed to block that for. So it did get released, but no one knows about it. The only reason I know about it <coughs> well, is because we found, with the freshwater fish, there's big impacts of cadmium on freshwater fish, at, one, at two parts per billion. So we're talking about one part per million here, at two parts per billion, our galaxids lose the ability, because it's a neurotoxin to them, their lateral sensory pores, they lose the effect of them at two parts per billion. And they swim sideways and they can't detect predators and prey, and, and, and so it's really toxic at that level. So it has other effects. We don't know what they all are yet. But, so this is, this is a massive issue that we have to, to face up with. This is, this is the issue. This, this sums up the whole problem. This graphic here from Ministry for the Environment's um, 2007 report shows the pathways of nutrients into to fresh waters. And, and I've, I've chucked in a bit of sediment stuff here as well. But basically the yellow arrows are where, and in this case it's mostly nitrogen, so you get the cows peeing here. Big fat cow, 100 litres of urine into one spot this big on the ground. There's no way the grass can take that up. It just goes down through the soil and into the groundwater, or either into the groundwater or laterally into the river and lakes. 
So then you've got the, so you've got the dairy cows here, the wastewater treatment plant, uh, sorry, the um, dairy shed effluent getting sprayed mostly, it gets sprayed onto the land. Most of the councils have moved from tipping it into streams, into a pond system. Now they've moved into spraying onto the land. Then you've got um, sheep and beef, and, and, and they put smaller arrows in there because there's less, less impact there. You've got the town, stormwater, um, wastewater treatment plant, septic tank, crops, all of these pathways for nitrogen, for nutrients to get into the water. What does the RMA cover? It covers, at best, 20% of the problem. So the cows are only in the cow shed for maybe two or three, four hours a day. So you're collecting the waste of that time. The rest of the time it's going down into the soil and gone. And even when you do collect it, it's not getting much treatment before it goes in or it's going back onto the land again. The stuff that comes out of the pipe. This is the only thing covered in the RMA. So no wonder we haven't sorted the problem and we never will because the big issue is the diffuse stuff. So this is what I talk about there being red herrings when it comes to all of the discussion that I hear about the impacts of dairy farming is how many dairy sheep consents have complied or non-compliance. They keep, keep talking about, oh, well, you know, with some great improvement, you know, we've got 70% compliance or we've got 30% non-compliance on our dairy sheds. That's a tiny part of the issue. If we take the wastewater treatment plant, one of the two rivers is a good example, 3 to 4% of the nutrient in that river comes from out of pipes from the town. The rest comes diffusely into the river from dairy farming. So the biggest impact, we're not controlling. We're just letting it go. Intensification. We didn't address the issue, that's the problem. And some people tell me, well, I, I, my understanding of the RMA is that it's effects based. It's quite clear effects of intensification, so therefore you could do something about it with the RMA. But, but other people tell me that no, you can't. So, but anyway, it's a moot point because it's happened. We've got this impact. So the other part of it is, and, and I, you know, I, I come from this um, region where we have this quaint kind of thing where um, we elect our councillors. We, we have democratic <laughs> elections for that. I know you guys have moved on to something better here, but they, but they do that. But I found out that at six of the 12 regional councils in New Zealand, the councillors decide who's going to get prosecuted and who isn't. Imagine that. These guys are going to be deciding on their, their mates. They might even be their own businesses they're talking about they're deciding on. That, that, I was so shocked to, to realise that. I mean, it won't, it won't be happening here. Um, I, you know, any of you that have been involved in the consent process or submission process will know this. So much um, bias towards the applicant. You know, I mean, you know, they've got they've, I've, the, the classic for me was sitting on the land and water forum for the last meeting a couple of weeks ago. There's 50 people sitting around this big room and, and they're all deciding on the future, future of fresh water in New Zealand. To my right is one representative from every power company in New Zealand. You know, there wasn't just one for the power companies, there was one from every power company. There was this Bernie Knapp from Stratera, you know, the mining organisation. There was Feds. They had a couple. Feds, Fonterra, Dairy New Zealand, um, you name it. There was a whole gang of farmer guys in, in, over here. Then over the other side of the room was, I, oh God, I forget. That, there was four people there basically. Well, there was iwi as well. There was probably four iwi different, you know, sort of um, iwi from around the country. They, you know, and I don't know where they stood because they didn't say a lot. But then on the green side there was me if I could make it, which wasn't very often because I've got a more than full-time job as it is. Guy Salmon from Ecologic, uh, Kevin from Forest and Bird, Kevin Hackwell, and a couple of guys on and off from Fish and Game. So, you know, my analogy is like a, a game of rugby where one team has 50 players and the other team has four players. And, and the referee's got no idea. He, he was just, you know, he's, he's just doing what he's told, basically. So this is, this is the Land and Water Forum, this is this collaborative process that's going to report tomorrow on, on the future of, of fresh waters in New Zealand. But it's not just a numeric thing either because each one of those players from the Stratera and the power companies and bed farmers and all that, they've got a lawyer, they've got a, they've got a planner, they've got all this resource that they can call on. Every, they've, they've got all the time in the world, it's their job to go to the Land and Water Forum and nothing else. That's what you concentrate on because everything you can claw back from that is a million dollars to us. So this is, this is the scary thing that's going on with the, with the management of it. And you've got this fast-tracking 
the, you know, the government wants to do away with the RMA. It already wasn't doing enough. Well, and I chucked in that death by a thousand cuts. I'm sure you all know that it's, you know, my classic example is the Manawatu River. 180 consented discharges into that river. Each one of those 180 is said to be uh, a less than minor impact. 180 less than minors. I mean, I don't know what the multiplying factor is of less than minors before it becomes a major, but that's what you've got is major because, lot, and, and that goes for everything. I mean, it's just non-stop war of you know people queuing up for consents to do bad things to the environment, and 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 mostly getting those consents as well. Now, a lot of these. South Island farms I see there's a huge amount of debt built up because of the infrastructure, these massive um, irrigation plants and you know that's a, that's a huge increase that you have to borrow the money for but a lot of it is just the land values going up over time. So this is, this is how it happens, so maybe start from the top. You've got this really cheap commodity that we're selling the cheapest possible milk powder, you know, it's just white powder, it's the same as everybody else's, we're flogging it off on a world market as a commodity. More than, I think it's up to 40% of the milk that's traded in the world comes from New Zealand now. Pretty much every country does their own milk, but the bit that's traded, 40% of it comes from New Zealand. So that's what we're doing, we're, we're, we're at the cheapest end of the market. So if you want to maximise product, if you want to make more money, you've got to add more cows. To add more cows, you've got to put more fertiliser on, you've got to buy in more feed, you've got to do that. You produce more per hectare. You, you, the drive is towards maximising production per hectare. Right? The, only, the way that I can explain this best is um, a dairy farm, a couple of them the economists at Massey are working on near us. 300 cows they're running at the moment. The economic threshold was 208 cows, I think. So they've got 100 more cows. Every one of those cows is costing them money. They're not making more money for each cow, it's costing them more. You need more farm workers, you need more fertiliser, you need more everything. But what they're doing is they're maximising the production per hectare because that's what sets the land value. So the land value goes up, so you become a property speculator, so that's what you're doing. But each time somebody new buys into the farm, then they have to borrow that money. So that, then you get this thing. But then you've got to have more income to pay the interest. So then you've got to farm harder and you go round and round and round in circles like this and this is what they're doing. They're on this rat exercise wheel or whatever you call it and they're going flat out because you've got this... What, but the crucial part of this is that... So the extra hundred cows, so we could get rid of a third of the cows and we wouldn't make any less money per farm, but, but that extra third cows is where the, all of the environmental impacts are happening. So it's, it's not a, a linear increase in impacts as you get more cows. Once you get past the threshold, like the economic threshold might be 200, the, probably the environmental threshold was around 100, and then once you get past that, the, the impacts just become incredibly worse. So we're trapped. We're trapped in this cycle here now where we just keep farming harder and harder, and we owe more and more money, and all of the extra money that we're making is out the door again in interest payments. So it's $12 billion a year income, at least $3 billion of that if you look at the interest on $30 billion, is gone again. So most of it isn't doing us any good. It looks good on GDP. This is the classic. Now we've, we're finally getting to the meat. I couldn't believe this the other day. So you would have heard of that one plan, I'm sure, in, 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 the, in the Manawatu. So the one plan is going to restrict the intensity of farming so that to protect the Manawatu River. It's not onerous. It, you know, feds are making it like their throats are cut, but it's only on future farming intensity. So we're pretty much status quo polluted river, it supposedly will stop it from getting more polluted. Of course they fought it, they fought it at consent stage and they managed to block it. And I, and I tell you, fought is not uh, an overstatement. The, the, the environment court, the, uh, the hearings panel chairman had to ask for a protection order on the Cawthron scientist who did that graph with the squiggly line on it that was showing all that impact that showed it was the most worst in, you know, in the West. That, because they got so much at feds, Dairy New Zealand, they were calling his boss, they were emailing him, he was getting really nasty, so the, so the chair had to tell him to back off and put a protection order on him. So that's, I'm talking serious fighting here, they blocked it at that stage, I was in Fish and Game and Doc, appealed to Environment Court, they got it reinstated, as of the other day, and then Hort New Zealand and Feds and Fonterra, no, maybe not Fonterra, 
but backed by Balance and Ravensdown, have appealed to the High Court. But they can only appeal on points of law, so we have no idea what's happening. But it just it shows you the true colours. These guys that are saying, and they're standing up the land and water forum, oh yes, we need to clean up our act, we need to clean up New Zealand, are fighting tooth and claw to stop this bit of legislation in the Manawatu because they see it as the thin end of the wedge. If it happens in Manawatu, it'll happen everywhere. And, and from the Feds um, and the industry point of view, they love it when an individual regional council tries to do something like this because it's so much easier to pick off you know, one individual regional council than try and take on the whole lot in the absence of a national policy statement. This started before the national policy statement. So then you get Carter coming on Radio New Zealand saying, this is no good, we've got to stop this one plan, it's going to cost 20 to 40 per cent of the profit of the farmers. So he's actually come up, he's just saying 40 per cent now. 40 per cent of the profit of those farmers will be lost if this plan is implemented. So of course that means that 40 per cent of their profit comes from polluting the river. That's the only, it's the only possible logical explanation. So if they have to not pollute the river, they'll make 40% less than what they did before. So we are subsidising them to 40% of their profit by allowing them to pollute the river. So, you know, what other industry could do that, could survive on that? Only the dairy industry could possibly think they could get away with that and, and maybe will if they can win in, in court. And we have no idea, I have no idea uh, about where, what the standing will be of the one plan once the outcome of the Land and Water Forum is implemented because it will be through an NPS at a higher level, so it may override all this anyway. But, so, so that to me, and, and, the, and the scary thing is that a whole bunch of dairy farms, as you can see, if they're, gonna, they're struggling as it is, the milk price dropping, 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 if 40% of their profit comes from polluting the river and you stop that, they got already 28% of them are on the verge of bankruptcy. So all you're gonna do and you know what, they're all going to blame me. <laughs> when they start going under, it's going to be my fault or our fault that they did that. So I'm, I'm, I kind of think that we should just go, nah, go for it boys, pollute away because we're going to cop the blame. Isn't it? The thing that gets me is ecologists aren't, it's not just ecologists anymore, or it's, it's, it's the economists that I'm really looking to now. Bernard Hickey, Rod Orham, the classic stuff he's doing on, on his articles in National Radio, and Gareth Morgan. And he summed us up. Well-off environmental pariahs clinging to resource-depleting practices, totally failing to transition to a sustainable quality economy. Just look at intensification in the South Island, look at the, the irrigation schemes, and you've got everything there for moving towards a totally unsustainable economy.